Um, it is lovely to be with you this morning. I greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive. And this is Pastor Diane with Onwards and Upwards on this Thursday morning. It is now eight minutes past ten. And whoever you are and wherever you are, a very, very warm welcome to you this morning to Onwards and Upwards on Agape FM, bringing the gospel nearer to you. And before I go any further, let me just add that Jesus is wonderful, absolutely wonderful, and I do mean that he's wonderful. And let's remind ourselves of the word of God this morning in Psalm 34 verse 8 that says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. So listeners, this morning, let's listen to the word of God. Let's keep it close to our heart. We're dealing with gifts of the Spirit. We are continuing from last week where we left off. And we're going to take a look at what there is still to say about the gifts of the Spirit. But let's just also remember to taste and see that the Lord is good. And that when we put our trust in him, that we are absolutely blessed because that is what the word of God says. And so this morning we give God glory. We give him honor and we turn our hearts towards Jesus Christ this morning, who is our redeemer and who is our savior. And we love him and we give him glory. We give him honor and we give him praise. And we are thankful this morning that we are able to tune in, that we are able to fellowship together on the airwaves over the Word of God as He teaches us, as the Holy Spirit instructs us and teaches us. We are grateful that He is here to give us understanding, to give us knowledge, and to give us wisdom of His Word. So let's get straight to it. For those who weren't tuned in last week, Today, on Onwards and Upwards, we are continuing with the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm going to do just a really brief recap on some of the things that we spoke about last week. And what we're doing is gifts of the Spirit. We started last week to look at, what did we look at? The revelational gifts there, I had to remind myself. And... Let's just look at our scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 11. We're going to go back there this morning as we go into our teaching. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it from the word of God for you. So we're in 1 Corinthians 12, we're starting at verse 4, and we're going down to verse 11. And this is a portion of scripture that teaches us about the gifts of the Spirit, just something small that God shares with us about the gifts. And so we start at verse 4, and it says, Now there are diversities of the gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit everyone. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another is given faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man as he wills. So here we have it, listeners, what God is saying to us about the gifts of the Spirit. And just to recap that these gifts, as we've just heard in the Word of God, belong to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives these gifts or shares these gifts with whoever He wills, with whoever He chooses. And these gifts do not belong to us. The operation of these gifts, the Spirit of God uses, works through us, but these gifts belong to the Holy Spirit. And there are nine gifts of the Spirit, and they are divided into three categories and we have the inspirational gifts, we have the supernatural, the power gifts, and we have the revelational gifts. 
And what we did last week is we started with the revelational gifts, the gifts of revelation. And we looked at the word of wisdom and we looked at the word of knowledge. And we ended our session last week where God operated those gifts and we were able to experience them in practice as there were a few words of wisdom and knowledge and a prophecy that went out to those listeners who it was applicable to. And we have more today that God has shared, that God has given, and we will come to that in the end. So just to recap a little bit about the word of knowledge, this is just that God reveals certain facts from his mind, and that's it. You know, God knows everything. He is omniscient, and he can reveal whatever he wants about anyone or anything when he sees fit to a person who operates in the word of knowledge. But God doesn't do this just for fun. He doesn't do this to reveal something about someone, but he does it to edify, to encourage, or to rebuke of sin. And God just through the word of knowledge shows and does show or can show what is, what has been, or what is to come. So let's remember that, that a word of knowledge, you know, we can even have a dream or vision and God can show us something about someone. And I dreamt a few nights ago that there were workmen inside the house of someone. And God showed me that what is happening in this person's life is that he is working, he is refurbishing, he's doing construction in the life of that person and the spiritual life of that person. Because in a dream or a vision, a house is always significant of our spiritual life. And so the Lord showed me, he said, in that person's life, there's construction going on. I'm helping them. I am refurbishing. I am doing what I need to. I'm pulling down, I'm breaking down, and I'm building up and I'm renewing. That's a word of knowledge. And so a word of knowledge is always to show something, but it can be used that you can, the person operating in the word of knowledge could go along to someone and say, this is what God has shown me, and I see that in this area that you need prayer. And so it can reveal something, an area of need where someone perhaps needs help. Then we started on the word of wisdom. And the word of wisdom, the second revelational gift, is always about a wise word, a little bit of advice or a what to do or a how to. And God gives that. He gives guidance. He gives direction through the word of wisdom. I recall at some point many years ago that there was someone who was going to move to another town and they'd made up their mind to go and they went to church one morning and someone got up in church and brought a word and said, there's someone who's planning to make a move and you're planning to move to another city and the city was named and then she went on to say, God is saying to you that this is not a wise thing to do now, that this is not what you should do now. So there we have a word of wisdom, a word of wisdom that just gives advice, that just helps us understand what to do right now in the decisions that we perhaps are making or that we perhaps are facing. So we're going to continue just with the end of the word of wisdom with the revelational gift. And I'm what I'm going to do is just as I continue with the word of wisdom, I'm going to recap slightly on the word of wisdom. And if we look at the life of Joseph, now Joseph, we know, we know so many things about him or the things that stick out in our mind. Uh, we know Joseph had a wonderful colored coat, the coat of many colors that his father gave him. We also know that Joseph was imprisoned, and he was imprisoned unfairly for something that he was completely innocent of. And we know that at the end of the day, when it was all over, when his trials were over, that he got promotion in the land of Egypt. And what we do here is we're looking at how he got out of prison, the example that I'm giving you this morning is that Pharaoh had a dream and he didn't understand the dream. And Joseph could interpret dreams. And God spoke to him a word of wisdom. And so when Pharaoh found out that there was someone who could interpret dreams, he called for Joseph and Joseph gave interpretation. What Pharaoh had dreamt 
was that there was famine coming to the land of Egypt, but that he wouldn't, he didn't know how to handle it. And Joseph came and said, right, when the good years come, seven good years, we will set aside grain so that after the seven good years, when the seven lean years approach, we will have food for the nation and for everyone. And it gave advice to Pharaoh through the word of wisdom on what to do in how to handle the famine that lay ahead. And so this is just a recap on the word of wisdom. And if we go down, we're looking at 2 Kings 20. Let me give you a little bit of an example from the Old Testament in 2 Kings 20. And what happens is the prophet comes to the king, to Hezekiah, and says to Hezekiah, you are going to die. So Hezekiah was sick. And here the prophet comes with something that's a situation in how it was going to turn out. And he says, prepare yourself because you are going to die. And we know that Hezekiah receives that word. And what, it is, what he decides to do is he cries out to God and he says, God, but I've served you. God, remember me. And because he cries out to God in faith, God sends the prophet back and says to Hezekiah, here comes the word of wisdom. God will add 15 years to your life and you will not die now. So there we have examples of the word of wisdom. But we're going on this morning because there are three revelational gifts, three gifts that reveal. And we want to look at the third one this morning as we start. And this is the discerning of spirits. Now, let me say right from the start that the discerning of spirits is not normal discernment. You know, the word of God speaks and teaches us that we should all have discernment and be wise when we make up our minds about people, about situations. We need to just not always be so rash and just to make up our minds so quickly, just like that. But sometimes we need to make a little, take a little bit of time and just take a step back and just have a look and just have a think and be discerning. Well, the discerning of spirits is not that. The discerning of spirits is something different. So there is a general discerning of spirits. Now, we are not talking about a general discerning of spirits. I'm sure all of you who may be listening this morning will be able to say to yourselves or think to yourself right now, yes, I'm discerning. I've discerned things in people. I've discerned things in situations that perhaps I realize, you know what, I don't really trust that person or I'm picking up something that I can't quite put my finger on and I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. That's general discernment. Now we are looking at the discerning of spirits. So this is a gift, a special gift at a special time that God is giving to the person operating this gift. And while I'm saying that, let's just remind ourselves this morning that every gift is given at a specific time when it is needed. So there is not one gift that is better than the other, but rather the best gift to operate in is the gift that is needed at the time. And that is the gift or the person that uses that gift that the Holy Spirit will bring to the forefront who is able to operate in that gift and use that gift. So we're looking at the discerning of spirits. And what the discerning of spirits does, it gives us insight. It gives us an eye into the spirit world. And you know, the spirit world is made up of good and evil. So, for example, there are there is an angelic spirit world and there is a demonic spirit world. And that's just a basic example of the spirit world being made up of good and evil. And the discerning of spirit, the gift of discerning of spirits gives us insight into that world. And it shows us the spirit behind a person or a situation, whether that is a good spirit or an evil spirit. And we are able to know through this gift who and what is operating through someone, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, let's just take an example, perhaps, of an evil spirit. And let's just take, perhaps, try and think of 
an evil situation. And we look at this and we think, I don't know why that person's doing that. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what they are thinking. But how can they do that? How can someone be a serial killer and kill 10 people in three months with no remorse in such a violent way? Now, I'm just giving you a basic example. Now, someone who has the discerning of spirits will look at that situation and immediately see that there is a spirit of murder and a spirit of violence behind the behavior of that person. And that is what's driving them. That is what is possessing them and controlling their actions to commit those atrocities. So there's an example of an evil spirit behind someone or behind something. But someone who operates in the discerning of spirits immediately knows that. They don't know where it comes from, but they know it in their spirit and they can see it. The discerning of spirits also operates in the fact that you can see in the spiritual realm, you can see an evil spirit on someone. And sometimes you will pick it up and you will just know and you will know in your spirit and it will grieve your spirit. There will be something about them that you know this is not right about someone. I don't know what it is, but I know that this is evil. And let me give you an example of what you can literally see through the discerning of spirits, through the gift of discerning of spirits, if the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to this, if you operate in this gift. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't always do this because this is a hectic side of the gift of discerning of spirits. And many years ago, when I was at Bible school, we had teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. And one of the teachings we had was from Kenneth Hagen in a church in America. And he had started the Rhema Church in America. Now I'm going back many, many years. And he was teaching us via video link on the gifts of the Spirit. And he was talking in this particular teaching about the gift of the discerning of spirits. And he was sharing with us that how many times when he would have a prayer line in church for sick people and people would come forward for healing that he would see as he got to that person that if the sickness or disease was demonically given or demonically inspired on that person, he would see that demon. And he gave us examples of how there was one particular woman. I remember a few examples stand out. There was one particular woman who came forward who was suffering from tremendous headaches and migraines. And as he looked at her and began to pray for her, he said he could see a monkey sitting on her shoulders with his arms around her head and squeezing her head. Now, in the spiritual realm, a monkey is symbolic of an evil, of an evil presence, of an unclean spirit. And he looked at that monkey, he took authority over it, spoke to that monkey and commanded it to leave in the name of Jesus. And he said he saw that monkey running out the church. Now, I'm just repeating to you by word of mouth what was told to me many years ago in a teaching on the discerning of spirits. And, you know, so if we literally see something, he said he would see uh, evil spirits in the form of other things on people around their necks or on their backs or on people's heads. And this would show that the oppression in their health that they were suffering, the tormenting that they were, were that was being put upon them and the torment that they were going through was because of an evil spirit. That is how the gift of discerning of spirit works. It shows behind something a good spirit or an evil spirit. Now, if you operate in this gift, you will know that you're operating this gift because you will have realized that you just know that through somebody or through a situation, whether it is demonically inspired or not, you know it, that you know it, that you know it deep inside. But to actually see the demon literally does not always happen, but it can happen. And that's why I've spoken about that this morning. And so the discerning of spirits is, you know, it's not something that I would say many, many people operate in. But I think people don't speak about it so much. I was chatting to someone this very week, and they've been through quite a trial 
and uh, tribulation in their home and within their own health and within their family. And what they shared with me that is in the middle of this trial, they saw dem demonic presence in their home. But they also saw angelic beings in their home. And what they knew was that the angelic beings represented the hand of God because they were praying. So many people were praying for them, for this person as well. And God was there and God was speaking and God was just showing and saying, I'm here. God was giving his word to encourage and they were able to literally see angelic beings in the home, protecting them and looking after them. But God showed the demonic beings as well, or the demons, if you like, as well. And God said, I'm showing you because you need to realize this is a spiritual battle, that these demons are here because they want something. This evil presence is here because it wants something. It wants you to be defeated in this trial that you are going through, but that you will not be defeated because I've sent my angels, my warring angels, to help you. And God's word does speak of his angels as ministering angels, as warring angels, angels who go to war on our behalf to help us. But interesting that this week that this person shared this story with me on how they had seen both good spirits, angels, and the evil spirits. And so there is just an example of the gift of discerning of spirits. And I began to question them and just ask them about their life in the past and things that they've known about people and picked up. And they began to talk and share with me how the gift of discerning of spirits has been operating in them for many years. So, you know, it's not always a gift that people may even realize or even speak about, but the Holy Spirit does give this gift for operation because very often we need to know so we can pray. There was someone that I was praying for last week sometime, someone who's got a terminal disease. And as I began to pray for them, God showed me instantly that it is demonically inspired. And so this person doesn't need healing, but they need deliverance. You see, when there is an evil spirit behind something, it isn't healing that we need, it is deliverance that we need. When something, when we are sick and it is not inspired by a demonic presence, we need healing, we need God's hand. But a demonic presence is gonna go nowhere if we just pray for healing. We need to pray for deliverance. We need to take authority over that demonic presence. And in the name of Jesus, we need to speak to it and drive it away and cast it out. So that is the benefit of the gift of discerning of spirits. That if something, whatever it is, operating through someone or a situation, and we need to do spiritual warfare and deliverance is needed, God reveals that through the gift of discerning of spirits. And let me just see here that uh, I've written down some examples and I want to give you these examples because I think it's important that the more examples we have, the more that we understand. Okay, here I've got one example written down. A few years ago, a friend of mine who lives in America now, they were in a difficult situation and this person is a missionary and so a missionary evangelist and they do travel around quite a bit and at one point they were in a place that wasn't really safe and they were there to evangelize they were there to do the work of the Lord and they were surrounded by it was a gang or it was a military group or of some kind that has had surrounded them that this group was questioning what these Christians were doing in that particular place. And they were fearful because they couldn't really speak the language and had no understanding of what was going on. There were only interpreters that they could work through. And he said that he just started to pray, just started to pray deep down without saying anything, just started to pray. As he looked at these people who were armed, who surrounded them and were threatening them, just started to pray deep down in his spirit. And the Lord said to him in his spirit as he was praying, he said, look up, look up and look beyond this group who's armed and see what I will show you. And he said, he looked up and he said, what was surrounding this group of armed militia who were surrounding them was a ring of fiery angels. 
And as he saw them, and he literally saw them, he said, all fear went from his heart. There was no fear. And he said, suddenly, just like that, all these armed men jumped up and ran away. And so here's another example. And this is literally a person that I know that shared the situation, was a testimony that they were giving in the church years ago of how when they were surrounded in reality by armed men and threatened, that God said, look up. And they literally saw the angels of God, fiery angels of God, surrounding their group and protecting them. That's fantastic. These are testimonies that we think are so marvelous. We like to hear stories like this. We like to hear testimonies like this. Because you know what? It shows that God is real. It shows that God is amazing. It shows that God is powerful. But this is the gift of discerning of spirits. Let me see if there is perhaps another example that I've got written down here that I can um, give you. I'm just seeing what I've, I've given you that example. Okay, there was in the past few weeks, I see I've got one last example here that I can share with you on this. In the past few weeks, uh, the past few months actually, I've been praying for someone who's been battling with sickness and really struggling and really being sick and at one point I saw death over their house and God said to me do you see there you see death he said now he said I'm showing you what is driving this I'm showing you the driving force behind this infirmity on this person and now you can take authority over it and now you can chase it so there we have just a basic example again of the benefits of the gift of discerning of spirits. But you know, we need to also, as I said last week about the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, including with the discerning of spirits as a revelational gift, we need to be so careful of how we operate in these gifts. And we need to be very careful of how we deal with things. We need to have integrity. And we also need to... Uh, be committed to do what's right in God's sight. If God shows us something, we need to pray because God is showing us for a reason. If God reveals something, we need to pray. We need to take that matter in hand and we need to pray. And as I said last week, and let me say it again this week, if a word of knowledge or uh, a word of wisdom or even the discerning of spirit comes through, it's not always that God requires us to approach that person one-on-one. -on -one. I think a lot of the time he is going to, but sometime he might just say, look, deal with the matter in prayer. And so we need to have wisdom. We need to be prepared in our heart to perhaps confront someone and say, I'd just like to share with you what God has shown me and pointed out. But let's always share in love. Let's especially if God points out sin, let's not share in an accusatory way. Let's not go in with judgment in our voice or in our manner, in our demeanor, but let's always share out of love and in a tone and an attitude of love. And whatever it is, it may be something exciting that God's given us to share with that person. Let's always do it in humility. But let's also Remember that we need to keep a guard over our mouth. So the things that God shows us about people, we cannot always just spread and share and mention their name to everyone around us and say, ah, oh, you know this person. Do you know what God said? Do you know what God showed? No, we need to take things confidentially and hide them in our heart because God doesn't expect what he reveals to someone for the benefit of someone else or for the benefit of another situation, God's not looking for us to be shouting that from the rooftops. So we need to be very, very careful and be prepared and know how to work with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because let's remember that they are His gifts. And so if we need or want advice on what do we do now, on what God has said to us, what God has shown us, the one to ask, is definitely the Holy Spirit, because they are his gifts. It should not be for us to want to ask our husband or our wife or our neighbor, hey, what do you think about this? God showed me this. What do you think I should do? Or what do you think I should say? Or how do you think I should handle it? 
No, the one to ask is the Holy Spirit. And in that way, we keep things in our confidence and we don't blurt them out to everyone around us. So that's the end of the revelational gifts. So we've come to the end of the revelational gifts. And what I'd like to do is go to the inspirational gifts. Now the inspirational gifts, we're going to have a look. And what they are is the gift of tongues, diverse tongues, and the gift of interpretation that goes with the diverse tongues, and the gift of prophecy. And what I'd like to do this morning is I'm going to go to one of the inspirational gifts and I'm just going to go this morning. I think we'll have time for the gift of prophecy. And I just want to spend a few seconds, a few minutes in going through the gift of prophecy this morning. And you know, I think one of the examples in the Bible is if we know the Old Testament at all and we go to the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament and we go to one of the well-known chapters in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37, we have a portion of scripture where God is speaking to the prophet and he's saying, son of man, can these bones live? And this is the well-known chapter of the valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel sees an army a valley of dry bones. And what these dry bones are, basically skeletons. Well, they are skeletons. And God says to Ezekiel, look at these dry bones. Look at these skeletons. Do you think that they can live? It's a whole army. There are so many of them, it's a whole army. Do you think, Ezekiel, that these dry bones can live? And God was speaking about the nation of Israel. You see, the Old Testament is so symbolic, and we need to know the symbolism about a lot of what we read, and then we'll understand it better. And Ezekiel looks at this army, and he says to God, oh God, only you know if these bones can live. And God says to Ezekiel, begin to prophesy to these bones, and begin to speak my word to these bones. And Ezekiel takes it by faith and he begins to prophesy to this valley, to this army of dry bones and say, bones, dry bones, live in the name of Jesus. And he begins to prophesy, begins to prophesy, thus saith the word and begins to prophesy the word to these dry bones, which are just bones, skeletons, dead people, a valley full enough to be called an army. And as Ezekiel does this in faith, the word of God says that these bones start to move, start to come together, start to take on sinews, start to take on muscles, start to take on flesh. And there's a whole army. And God was showing Ezekiel that if we prophesy life and we prophesy and speak because you know prophecy is to speak. To prophesy is to speak. If we prophesy life and we prophesy God's word to ourselves, to our situations, where we have been dead and are dead, we can have new life. And a whole army rose to its feet. And God was saying to Ezekiel, you see what I can do? But you prophesy. You prophesy life. You speak life to your situation. You speak life to your dry bones. You speak life to your dead bones. And that is an example in the Bible that's well known about the valley of dry bones or the valley of dead bones. But prophecy is to speak. That's what it is. It's to say something. And it's always the word of God. Prophecy is never something that we make up. It's never our own idea or our own thoughts or what we think might be coming or what is. We can't make up a prophecy. If you're longing to prophesy, wait on God and see if he gives you a prophecy. But definitely be able to hear from God enough that you know that what you write down are the words of God and not your own opinions, and not your own thoughts. And a prophecy is a supernatural utterance in a known tongue. So you'll speak to someone in their 
own language that they can understand, the language that you speak, and you speak in the mind of God. And it's what God wants to say at that time. And it could be what to do, what he's going to do. It could be about himself. It could be about ourselves, about our own life. But it's what God wants to say at that time to us or to a local body like a church or to a nation or to a city. And prophecy means to speak to another, just to speak on behalf of one to another. So we speak on behalf of God to someone else, on behalf of God, to a situation, on behalf of God, to a nation, on behalf of God, to a city. Prophecy is for exhortation, it's for edification, it's for knowledge, and it's for comfort. Anyone who prophesies it does not make you a prophet. However, anyone who carries the office of a prophet, the fivefold callings, the fivefold offices, a prophet will always prophesy, but just because you prophesy, it does not make you a prophecy. Because prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and as we've heard, he is able to share these gifts with whomever he wills, for them to operate whenever he wills. Now let me just close with prophecy as we come to the end of prophecy this morning. One of the inspirational gifts is that Old Testament prophecy was to foretell the future. Now, if you go through your Bible and you look up prophecy, you will see that God always foretold the future. In fact, the example in Ezekiel 37 that I gave you a few moments ago was God was showing Ezekiel what would happen to the nation of Israel. He was saying, I'm going to come give them life and they will no longer be an army of dead bones and no longer an army of dry bones, but they will rise up. And they will live once again. So prophecy in the Old Testament was to foretell the future. Now we are in the New Testament. Now we are in what is called the dispensation of grace or the age of grace. And prophecy now is not to foretell the future. All right. It is to speak. It is to speak on behalf of God to someone else. But what prophecy is useful for now in the age that we live in is forth telling not foretelling but forth telling and what forth telling is it tells now that's it it just tells now god says something right now and whatever he wants to say he is saying it now that is prophecy so we've done a little bit of prophecy this morning one of the inspirational gifts as we've continued in our gifts of the spirit and what I'm going to do is I would like to open on the words that God has given me for people this morning. And we're going to have a look. I trust that those who got words from God last week were blessed, that there were many that those words were appropriate for, that there were many tuned in, that were listening, that received those words and took them by faith. And before I read and speak out the words that God has given me this morning for you listeners, let me just remind you that any word that we receive, for it to come to pass in our life, we have to take that word by faith, and we have to appropriate that word. We have to believe it, and we have to receive it. Okay, so by God's grace, Let's go and let's see what the Lord is saying to us. And Spirit of God, let's just say thank you right now. Holy Spirit, thank you that you've revealed things about people. You have revealed things because you want to help them. You've revealed what you are doing in their lives and that they can trust you for these things and they can receive these words in faith, Holy Spirit, as we see what you say. And somebody, a woman, and your name is Ursula, and I see that you have serious kidney problems. And your problems are so bad that it is, maybe, that you are having kidney dialysis. And God says, he knows that this is serious. But God says he is undertaking for your kidneys. And so trust him for that, Ursula, wherever you are. Trust the Lord, although he says something so quick and so simple, that he knows that you have serious kidney problems. Trust God. For your kidneys for health and for life in your kidneys take that word grasp it this morning 
hold it in your heart and just begin to thank God as he begins to touch your kidneys. And we're having a look at Patricia. And Patricia, wherever you are this morning, God says to you that he sees that you have serious marriage problems. But he says, and he says, he sees that you are in fear and you have doubts about your marriage and there's lots of fear and there's problems. There are things going on. God says pray. And you know, we think, oh, anyone can say God says pray. God wants us to pray. It's the most uh, natural thing that we should do is to pray. No, you know, if God says pray, God is saying pray for a reason. And Patricia, you may have been praying. God is saying pray. So he's saying continue. Take this matter in prayer on a daily basis if you can and pray. And he's saying pray because he's saying that prayer is essential in this matter. That this matter in your marriage is not going to resolve itself. It's not just going to suddenly, that's it. You need to pray. And God says, ask him. So take the word of God seriously, Patricia, this morning concerning your marriage and ask God. And before you ask God, make up your mind and know, be steadfast in your heart, what you're going to ask him. Because he wants you to ask him in faith and he's going to answer you. So God says, pray. Pray into this matter of your marriage. And God says, ask him. And be careful before you ask God. That's why you need to take time to consider in this marriage what you are going to ask God as you begin to extend your prayers even deeper than they have been going. Then I want to move on to Rob or to Robert. But I think you are called Rob or known as Rob. And Rob, I see that you are an alcoholic. But you know what God says this morning? He says that he loves you. And he says he sees your struggle. And he says he sees your heart. And he sees that you want and you are trying to change. And just to your, for your thinking to be different and for your behavior to be different. God says he sees your struggle and he understands your struggle. And just because you're struggling with something, God says don't think that he's not there with you, that he's not in that struggle. He says he is there, and he says he does know, and he says call on him. He says call on him. You know, at the difficult times, and we shouldn't actually only call on God, Rob, I just want to say to you, in the difficult times, we also need to call on him just in the good times, and just even if it's just with gratitude in our heart or thankfulness. But God's saying call on him. Call the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus, Rob. Call on him. When you feel temptation or if you feel that you've been let down and you've let yourself down and you just don't know what's going on and you try and you try and things just don't seem to change, call on the name of Jesus. If you're feeling down and you're feeling disappointed, call on the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is powerful. And that's what the Lord says to you. He says you are not alone. And in the struggle, and he says he sees that you have been fighting and that you have been really trying, God says, don't give up. He says, don't give up. You are not alone. And call on him. Call on his name. I see a Zeliswa. And Zeliswa, I see that you can't fall pregnant. But God says, a baby is on its way. And so that's exciting news. Exciting, wonderful news a blessing from God. If God says it's going to happen, be sure it's going to happen. Believe the Lord this morning and trust him that he will bring it to pass and that he will keep his word. I see a Margaret. And a Margaret, God says to you, keep praying. There is something that you are praying about. And you know what? You are so weary by now. You've exhausted everything that you can even pray over this matter that you don't even know what to say anymore. God says, keep praying. He says, be relentless. And if you think that you've been relentless, he says, begin to be relentless all over again. God says, keep knocking on his door. You know, in the gospel, Jesus teaches a parable, uh, Margaret, and he just says, keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking perseverance that's perseverance so margaret whatever it is that's on your heart 
that is quite a thing to you that is on the table between you and God, God is encouraging you to keep going. He's encouraging you to persevere and to be absolutely relentless. Then we're moving on to Dan or to Daniel or to Danny. And you will know who you are. And the Lord says to you that it is time to forgive. He says, actually, it's so long overdue. He says, and you know this deep down in your heart. And God is not pleased because the length of time we take to, to forgive is important to the Lord. You see, we can't say, oh, well, eventually I'll forgive. You know what? Forgiveness needs to be almost instant. And God says, it's time for you to forgive. And God says he knows you were hurt. He says an offense was taken. He says, and there is pain and sorrow that you were caused through this matter that came your way. But he says it is long overdue. And I see that it's a grievance, a grievance that you took up by a neighbor, from a neighbor. And I'm talking about a literal neighbor. And I don't know if it's literally at this point in time, someone who lives next door to you, but it's someone who did live next door to you. Perhaps you lived somewhere else and it was a grievance that came about through a neighbor. God says that you need to forgive, that this unforgiveness has gone on for far too long. And the Lord says in actual fact, the unforgiveness in your heart has grown and it's turning you into another person. So Dan or Daniel or Danny, you're becoming bitter. And God doesn't want that because that is not of the Lord. God wants you to be free of unforgiveness. And so all you need to do is just repent, lift your hand to God and say, God, it's me. God, I'm guilty. Forgive me. And God, I forgive this person and I release this person. I'm looking at a Mary now. And Mary, the Lord says to you that you're running a race. He says the walk of God on earth um, the kingdom of God, the word of God says we run a race. And the Lord says to you, you are running a race and that you must get up from the sidelines. You know, in a race, we can't just sit down when we feel like it and think, well, it's too hot. I'm tired. I'm sitting down on the fence here or I'm sitting down under the tree and I'm not running at the moment. That's not how we run a race. When we start running a race, we finish a race and the race we run as we love God, as we serve God, as we come into his kingdom, Mary, as we become a part of his army, it is a race that we run. And God says you must stand up from the sidelines and from stop, be, from stop being a spectator. And God says keep going. Keep going. Whatever is making you weary, whatever caused you to sit down and to just stop running and just Think to yourself in your heart, oh, I think enough is enough now. I'm just tired. Or perhaps you took offense and you thought, well, I'm not interested anymore. God knows your name. He knows. He knows where you are on the sidelines and he wants you back. And he wants you back in the race that he has set for you to run. And God says you need to pull off the weight, the yoke on your shoulders, the offense that you have that caused you to stop running and you need to put it down because that's why you stopped. The burden became too heavy for you, Mary, to carry. God says, get back into the race. Stand up from the sideline. Put your disappointment down and start running the race. Mike, I have a scripture for you from Proverbs 10, verse 22. And Mike, whoever you are, Proverbs 10, 22 just says, Wonderful scripture, powerful scripture. Take it, Mike. Think about it. Let it just go and saturate you into your heart, into your spirit, your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, your body. Proverbs 10, 22 says, The blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow to it. So we thank God for that. And I see a Norma. And Norma, God says, you know what? He sees that you need strength. There is something going on in your life, and he says, you need his strength. He reminds you of Nehemiah 8 verse 10 that says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And just stretch your hand forward in faith and pull your strength from God because that is where your strength comes from. God is giving you strength. I see someone suffering with bunions on their feet. Bunions are 
uh, growth that it's very painful to wear shoes. In actual fact, you can't wear closed shoes or not even open shoes, depending on how big the bunions are. Make your feet feel very painful and it's painful to walk or do anything. God's healing that. You're going to notice that these bunions are going to shrink, whoever you are. These bunions are going to shrink. They're going to get smaller and they will, one day you will wake up and they will be gone. And that is the supernatural healing hand of God. There is someone who's got a bladder infection and this bladder infection reoccurs. It's reoccurring all the time and the Lord says he is healing you of that bladder infection. And there's someone with gallstones. You have problems in your gallbladder. In actual fact, the doctors have advised that they're going to remove the gallbladder. God says that he is healing you and removing those gallstones and the problems from your gallbladder. I see a Lindy where Lindy, where God says, whatever decisions you are looking at, he says, go for the education. Educate yourself. Where you are thinking to go and study, God says, go for it. He says, that is what's right for you at this point in time. And that is Lindy, where. Then I've got Zandile. Zandile, the Lord says, concerning your employment, that you are not going to lose this job. Although you've heard rumor or you feel perhaps you might or something's going on, God says you will not lose this employment. But what he does say is that at a later time, perhaps in a few months time or even in the new year, that he will bring something else across your path. And that will be the right move to make. That right now you will keep your work. You won't lose your job. And so you stay there. And then God will bring something across your path. This is for Zandile, perhaps in the new year. And that will be a move that you can make of yourself to whatever God brings to you. And so, Father, let's just thank God, people. We're just going to go ahead and thank God for his word this morning. We're going to thank God for the encouragement and the revelations he's given through the word of knowledge and the words of wisdom this morning that he's given to people. I say and remind you, take them by faith and expect them to happen. Don't be dubious or doubtful because already then you've lost it. And so let's just give God some praise and give God some thanks this morning as we want to close our session. And so, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we thank you for your teaching. Father, we thank you for your word this morning that has gone out where you've just educated us, God, on the gift of the discerning of spirits. You've, dem you've reminded us on the gift of the word of knowledge and the gift of the word of wisdom. Father, thank you that as we learn and grow, that we change and that we can also, if we want to God, say, Father, use me. Use me, God. Operate a gift through me. Father, that we would be willing and obedient to use and learn to how to use those gifts, God, that we may bring glory to your name, Father, for that is what these gifts are for. Holy Spirit, we understand these are your gifts. And if we operate in your gifts, we will not brag. We will not have a big mouth as to what we saw and to what we know and to what we said. For Holy Spirit, these gifts are not ours. We do not have the ability to operate in them beyond the ability that you give us. These are your gifts and we give you glory, Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you this morning for what you've spoken out to many listeners who have been listening and you perhaps are still going to tune in, God, on the podcasts and, and the video links, Lord, and perhaps aren't listening live, but may listen at a later time, Lord. Some of these words may be applicable to those people still to tune in. God, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you for what you've spoken, for what you've revealed this morning, for what you've brought out, the way you've encouraged. God, some of the words may have been uh, a little bit harsh, but God, it's encouragement. It's shown us, Father, that you know us, you see us wherever we are. We cannot hide from you. And Lord, we need you to speak to us all the time. So we appreciate this morning what you have spoken to us. God, if we, as we have gathered together this morning on onwards and upwards, we give you glory and we say thank you. So listeners, wherever you are, whoever you are, I want to say to you this morning, thank you for tuning in on onwards and upwards this morning. This Thursday morning, the 30th of September, it is now Two minutes past 11. This is Pastor Diane. And let me end with, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Please tune in again next Thursday morning and join us at 
10 a.m. for onwards and upwards. Thank you.